Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Petri Wine brings you the casebook of Gregory Hood. Tonight, the Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to the story of Murder in Celluloid. Another exciting adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood. As for me, I'd like to know if you're planning to have chicken for dinner any night this week. Because no matter how you like that chicken, roasted, fried, or in the stew with dumplings, you like it a lot better served with a glass of Petri California Sauterne. Now there's something to talk about. Chicken and Petri Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a clear white wine, delicately fragrant. And what a flavor that Petri wine has. It's, well, all I can say is, it, it's the wine you've been looking for. A wine that brings you the luscious flavor of big, plump, sun-ripened grapes. And say, Petri Sauterne is not only great with chicken, but you like it served with fish or any kind of seafood, too. So try a bottle of Sauterne. Get Petri Sauterne. Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, always spell good wine. Petri wine. Well, it's Monday night in San Francisco, and we have a date with Gregory Hood. Tonight's rendezvous is at his apartment high on Knob Hill and overlooking the Golden Gate. Let's join him there, shall we? Hello, Gregory. Harry Bartell, come on in. I was expecting you. Uh, where's Sandy Taylor tonight, Greg? He flew up to Vancouver today. There's some legal business he had to attend to for me on a shipment coming in from the Orient. He'll be back in a few days. Glass of sherry, Harry? Thanks. Well, <laughs> Siamese cat. Uh, a new addition to the Maynage, Greg? Oh, no, no. Sam's an old retainer. He's been up at my place at Russian River. I flew him down with me this morning. He's mighty friendly. What did you say his name is? Well, officially, it's Sing Lo, but his host of friends decided it was too dignified a name for such a whimsical character. So he was christened uh, Sam Thurber. Greg, um, am I crazy, or is Sam cross-eyed? Oh, yes, yes. He's cross-eyed and his tail's broken, but he has a delightful, dusky little soul. Haven't you, Sammy? <laughs> well, Sam has another fan now. Here's your shirt. Thanks, Greg. And now... I'm... I know, I know. You have that Monday night look in your eye. You want a story out of my case. <laughs> Correct. And from the hint you gave us last week, it sounded as though you had quite a special one lined up. Well, this was a strange business, Harry. The whole thing happened in Hollywood. What were you doing down there, Greg? Metropolis Studios were making a picture called Passport to Danger. My old friend Ray Hansen was directing it. The story was about a girl who inherits an importing business and gets into a struggle between her private life and being a career woman. And you were called in as a technical advisor? Well, not quite that, Harry. Ray called me one night and said that he had some headaches on the importing business angle of the picture. So the next morning, I hopped into my beach craft and flew down to the city of Celluloid. As you know, I'm something of a gourmet. How well I know. So it was only natural that my lunch that day was eaten at the Brown Derby in Hollywood. As I entered that star-studded home of good food, I was greeted by Bill Chilliard, famed maitre de Mr. Gregory Hood, it's good to see you back in town. Hello, Bill. It's good to be back. I have a usual table for you. This way, please. Thanks. Oh, by the way, Bill, I hope that on this trip you'll break down and give me the recipe for that Cobb salad. <laughs> I don't know if Mr. Cobb would like me to. Oh, come on, Bill. Bob Cobb and I are old friends. He'd approve. Well, Mr. Hood, here's your table. I know you start off with three kinds of lettuce, romaine, chicory, and iced lettuce. Break it up very Correct, fine. Correct, Mr. Hood. Then you slice up some bacon in tiny stripes, some chopped chives, and then comes the cheese. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, Bill. Uh, who's that girl sitting two booths away? Miss Sheila Graham, one of our best movie columnists and radio commentators. I thought it was. I must go and talk to her. I'll get the rest of that recipe from you before I go, Bill. Very well, Mr. Hood. Sheila Graham, how nice to see you again. Gregory Hood. I heard you were in town. You did? I only flew in this morning. You get your news fast, Sheila. My spies are everywhere, Gregory. In this case, I met Ray Hansen at a beach party at Malibu last night. He told me you were coming. Uh, what brings you to town, Gregory? <laughs> Said she, whipping out her golden ever sharp. Certainly. Your news, Gregory. Famous importer, man about town, and amateur detective flies into Hollywood. 
I mentioned it on my radio show. I heard you had a new show, Sheila. What time is it? I must catch it. Sunday night, 8.45 on Mutual. Oh, nicely spoken. I shall listen. Thank you kindly. And now, Greg, which of our starlets is responsible for your being in town? Well, it isn't a girl this time, Sheila. I came down to give Ray Hansen a little help on the importing business for Passport to Danger. Oh, yes. That's the Nedda Mason and Norwood Opus. Funny thing. Nedda's having luncheon with me today. Have you met her? No, no, but I hear she's what is known technically, I believe, as uh, a dish. A little too highly spiced a dish for my liking, but she's good coffee. I did meet Ann Norwood. Isn't she sweet? I fell hopelessly and head over heels in love with her. Seems impossible that an eight-year-old girl can be a movie star and yet be so utterly unspoiled. Here comes Nedda Mason now. Watch her switch on the personality. Hello, Nedda. Sheila, darling. Oh, I'm so terribly sorry I made. They simply mobbed me for autographs. Do you know Gregory Hood? Oh. Miss Nedda Mason. How do you do? So you're the same as Gregory Hood. Ray told me you were flying down. You're going to help us on the picture, aren't you? If I can. It's a marvelous script, and I've got a dream of a part. And Sheila, darling, the clothes. All Adrian's designed me the most heavenly outfit. I think I must be an artist, my dear. I just can't keep away from mirrors these days. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Hood. Oh, yes, Bill. There is a young lady waiting for you at the table. There is? Excuse me, Sheila. See you again before I leave. Fine, Greg. Nice to have met you, Miss Mason. Now here's the studio. Well, well, Miss Ann Norwood. Hello, Mr. Hood. You didn't mind me sitting down at your table, did you? I'm very flattered, Ann. I had to see you alone. That's why I didn't come over to the other table. I saw Miss Netta Mason was there. And you don't like her? Oh, it isn't exactly that. Oh, I do think she talks awfully loudly, don't you? Yes, Ann, I do. Mr. Robin Hood, you're a detective, aren't you? In an amateur way. And incidentally, Anne, the name is Gregory, not Robin. I know. But I think you're just like Robin Hood. And he was wonderful. And so I think of you that way. <laughs> I'll admit that my prices might be called stealing from the rich. And I do give to the poor, but that's where the resemblance ends, I'm afraid, Anne. But I'm very flattered that you think of me that way. I do, Mr. Hood. That's why I've come to you for help. You see, my daddy's dead and I... I do so miss having a man to talk to. Of course you do, Anne. You go ahead and talk. I have a very, a very serious problem. I need a detective. Dear me, Anne. Whatever is the matter? Somebody has stolen my map. My super map. I've been working on it for weeks. And I'm good at math, too. At least my teacher says I am. Well, what kind of a map was it? It's something I invented. It's full of forts and secret weapons and dockyards. And now it's been stolen. And when did you see it last, Anne? This morning. It was in my portable dressing room in the studio. I was working on it between scenes. When I came back just before lunch, it had gone. Oh, dear, here comes Mommy. Oh, darling, you frightened me. Why did you slip away like that while I was parking the car? I had to see Mr. Hood. Mommy, this is Mr. Robin. I mean, Gregory Hood. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Hood? How do you do? Uh, do sit down, won't you? Well, just for a moment. And uh, you haven't been bothering Mr. Hood, have you? Not a bit of it. She knew that I was an amateur detective, and she came to me with a problem. I'm very flattered. You see, Mommy. <laughs> the missing map, I suppose. Of course. And Mr. Hood's going to find it for me, aren't you? I'll do my best, Anne. Uh, who do you think might have stolen it? I think it was Miss Madam Mason. It must have been either her or Major Courtney. They were the only two people in my dressing room today, except Mother. Major Courtney, that name seems familiar. Who is he? Uh, well, uh, I suppose you might say... Uh... He's a suitor of mine. He's terribly stuck on money. And, dear, that's not very nice. What branch of the army is he in, Mrs. Norwood? Honestly, I don't know. And if I did, I shouldn't tell. It's all some terrific secret. He doesn't even wear a uniform. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. You both have lunch with me. Then we'll drive over to the studio and see if we can find that map for you, Anne. Oh, Mr. Hood, you're so wonderful. <laughs> My dressing room, Mr. Hood. Do you like it? Very much, Anne. You don't think it's a little young for me, do you? Mother had it decorated. Anne, I think it's perfect for your personality. Clean and fresh and cool. Mr. Hood, you say the loveliest thing. Are you married? No, Anne. I've always been waiting for the right girl. Keep waiting, Mr. Hood. She'll come along. I just know she will. Very well, Anne. But while I'm waiting, let's see if we can track down that map for you. Where did you last see it? 
It was on the dressing room table here. Uh, when you leave this dressing room and go before the cameras, do you lock the door? Always. Mommy never forgets. And the arrangement of the door and window in here is such that no one could have slipped in a, a hand through here or sneaked in and stolen it. Then it must have been Miss Madam Mason or Major Courtney. Yes, it looks like it. And yet, Anne, I, I can understand someone wanting one of your mats, but if he did, he'd ask you for it. He wouldn't steal it. But if the person, whoever it was, thought it was one of Major Courtney's maps, it would be different. Why would it be different, Mr. Hood? Your mother hinted that he might be in special service for the Army. You said your map had mm. forts and secret weapon sites on it. Now do you see, Anne? Yes, Mr. Hood. And that would mean Miss Madam Mason's a spy. Oh, goody, this is fun. No, no, darling, you mustn't go around saying she's a spy. I'm just dreaming up a very wild mm. plot. The chances are that a gust of wind came through the window and blew your map out into the studio. Oh, no. I like it so much better the other way, Mr. Hood. <laughs> Frankly, Anne, so do I. Come in. Hello, Anne, darling. Uh, hello, Mr. Fremont. This is a very great friend of mine, Mr. Gregory Hood, Mr. Philip Fremont. How do you do? He's playing the lead in, the, in another picture on the lot. Say, Anne, isn't this yours? I found it on the studio floor. It's my map. It's my super map. Oh, you see, Anne, it wasn't stolen after all. Stolen? Annie, did you think someone had stolen your map? Yes, I did. It's an awfully good map. I, uh, I hear that you're an amateur detective, Mr. Hood. In an unobtrusive way. Why? Well, I was wondering where Annie dreamed up the idea that her map had been stolen. I guess you put her up to it. Do you? <laughs> well, it's a bad guess, Mr. Seymour. And my name isn't Annie. It's Anne. Okay, honey, don't get mad at me. I was just trying to be funny. Mr. Fremont. Uh, yes, Charlie? On the set, please. Rehearsal of the next scene. Okay, Charlie. See you later, Anne. Nice to have met you, Mr. Hood. Um, goodbye. Mr. Hood. Yes, Anne? You know, I'm sorry my map was found so easily. Why, dear? You won't detect it for me anymore. And I was having such fun. So was I. Supposing it really had been stolen, Mr. Hood, why would Mr. Fremont have brought it back? Well, since I dreamed up a hypothetical case in the beginning, I might as well give you a hypothetical solution. You use such lovely words. What does hypo... What does it mean, Mr. Hood? Well, I meant that we were still playing at let's pretend the map was stolen. Let's suppose the thief thought there were plans of Major Courtney's, and he stole them. When he examined them, he found they were harmless, so he threw them away. Mr. Fremont found them, knew that you were quite a map maker, and brought them back to you. Oh, you're so clever, Mr. Hood. I bet that's what happened. I wouldn't take the bet, Anne. Let me look at the map, will you? Of course. I'll do one for you if you like. Oh, naturally. I'd like it very much. That's odd. What is it, Mr. Hood? There are red marks on the corner of your map, Anne. They're made by nail polish that hasn't quite dried. Nail polish of a peculiarly horrendous shade of purpley crimson. The exact shade that Miss Netta Mason was wearing at the Brown Derby today. Perhaps she is a spy after all. Perhaps. Look, Anne. Even though you've got your map back, I might as well follow this business through. There's something funny going on here. I think so, too, Mr. Hood. I just know Miss Netta Mason's a spy. Did you look at those eyes of hers? Yes, Anne. I got the slant. Let's go to her dressing room and talk to her, shall we? This is her dressing room, Mr. Hood. You better knock. I always knock, Anne. It's uh, lucky. Oh. Hello, Mr. Latimer. Ah, uh, it's my dream boat, Annie. How are you, darling? Mr. Lou Latimer. Mr. Gregory Hood. Glad to meet you, Mr. Latimer. Oh, just call me Lou. Say, you're Greg Hood. I know about you. You sell old hunks of ivory for big dough in San Francisco. And you're an amateur sleuth who can show up the pros. And you're a wolf in good standing. Listen, Lou, I also pack a mean lift. Clean it up a little, can't you? Oh, a little Lord Fauntleroy character, huh? Okay. Beat me to a pulp and call me Juicy. Ah, ha, ha. Get it? Pulp? Juicy? Don't uh... overplay it, Lou. It gives me ideas. Mm. Uh, character, huh? But death. Listen, I'm handling the publicity on this little super-duper colossal hunk of picture. I've got an idea. It'll slay you, Greg. I'm mortal, just like the next man, but I'll listen to it later. Mm. Right now, Anne and I want to see Netta Mason. Is she in her dressing room? Oh, death. She went in about half an hour ago, and I've been sitting here ever since, dreaming up ideas. Anyone else been in to see her? Natch. Philip Fremont, the alleged actor, went in. Also Major Courtney, the man of mystery. They've both left now, though. So, oh. And I'm going in alone. Stay here with Mr. Latimer, will you? Why can't I go with you, Mr. Hood? <laughs> you know how it is, Anne. You're a sophisticated girl. When you go to see a beautiful spy, you go alone. I know. It's just like in the funny. I think she was a dragon lady. You wouldn't want another woman... Like me alone. That's right, Anne. You're very understanding. 
I'll be back in a moment. Ah, oh, character. Greg Hood is a definite character, but in dube. I love Mr. Hood. Why, not, Jenny? Oh, by the way, Dreamboat, I've got a terrific angle for you on this picture. Oh, no, Mr. Lavinia. Not again. Oh, this one's a natural, honey child. We give you a big balloon, see? It has Passport to Danger printed on it. Now, Passport, spelled backwards, is Tropsap, see? No, Mr. Latimer, I don't see. Look, baby, Tropsap is the name of a cereal, see? Now, we get them to ask you why you're so healthy. And you say you always breakfast on Tropsap because backwards it spells Passport. And that's in the title of your Super Duper Smasher. Oh, you get it, Annie? No, Mr. Latimer, I don't eat Tropsap. I've never even heard of it. I wouldn't tell a lie. A lie, she says, yes. Listen, honey child, you're not getting a point. It's a big balloon. Maybe we fill it up with uh, hydrogen. But, you see, it's got this billboard on each side of it, see? And when they and, ask you... Oh, and... Hmm. Hello, Mr. Hood. I'm glad you're back. Your mother left a message. She wants you to call her. She's back at the Brown Derby. It's quite important. Oh. All right, Mr. Hood. Wait here for me, won't you? Yes, Anne, I'll wait. Ah, what's the matter, pal? You look as if you've seen a ghost. I have. Close the studio gates and send for the police. The police? What's wrong? Plenty. Miss Nedda Mason's lying in her dressing room. She's been strangled. You'll hear the rest of Gregory Hood's story in just a second. So I'm going to tell you about a red wine that's really marvelous with any kind of meat or meat dish. The wine is Petri California Burgundy. Petri Burgundy is a rich, full-flavored wine, a wine so unusual that it can turn a simple meal into a real feast. For proof, next time you have hamburgers or your favorite kind of stew for dinner, serve it with a glass of Petri Burgundy. Your whole dinner becomes more colorful. And as for the wine itself, well, Petri Burgundy will make you smack your lips for fair and just sigh with pleasure. Be sure you get Petri Burgundy. Because Petri is always good wine. Well, Gregory, so you found Nada Mason strangled in her dressing room, huh? What happened when the police got there? Well, Lou Latimer, the publicity man, persuaded me not to send for them right away. He probably figured that you could solve the case, hand the killer over to the police, and so avoid as much publicity as possible. Huh? Correct, Harry, and I somewhat grudgingly agreed. And so, having gotten little Ann Norwood safely out of the studio, Lou Latimer and I went back to the dead girl's dressing room where I began to search for any clues. Find any clues, Greg? Not so far, Lou. Except that the thumb mark shows she was strangled from behind. No chance of identifying them, I'm afraid. Gee, Greg, how do you figure this killing? It's a hard one to figure. Maybe the explanation I had lived at the studio for Ann Norwood's benefit might fit the killing at that. Well, it looks simple enough to me. I saw Netta walk into her dressing room. I was sitting outside it until you came out. Now, apart from yourself, only two people went in. Major Courtney, the man of mystery, and that ham actor, Philip Fremont. Uh, it must be one of them. Hello, hello. Now we've got a clue. Look what's clenched in her right hand. Huh? Ah, that looks like some kind of pin. It's a Sigma Xi key. What Sigma Xi? An honorary fraternity for science. A sort of scientific equivalent of Phi Beta Kappa. But there's no name on this key. So you still don't know which one of the two it is? Which one of the three? Huh? Well, how do you figure three, Greg? Proving it's two only rests on one thing, Lou. Your word alone. That makes you, my friends, the third suspect. Sheila Graham speaking. I'm Gregory Hood. Hello, Gregory. What's on your mind? I need some help, Sheila. Can you give me any facts on Philip Fremont's educational background? Yes, I can. I did a piece on him the other day. He's a college man, got into acting through the Hasty Pudding Club at Harvard, majored in English. No science, Sheila? No, Greg. I see. Do you know Lou Latimer, publicity man at Metropolis? <laughs> know him? He pesters me almost daily. Why, Gregory? Well, how about his educational background? Well, Lou claims that he graduated from high school. Personally, I'd say that if he ever got beyond the fifth grade, I'd want to see the proof. Oh, thank you, Sheila. You're a remarkably well-informed girl. I'll call you later. Goodbye. <laughs> Mrs. Norwood, why did you bring Anne back here to the studio? Oh, I simply couldn't keep her away, Mr. Hood. Where is she now? In her dressing room, talking to Major Courtney. Oh, I'm anxious to meet him. Oh, well, come along then. Let's go in. Right. Robin Hood. Uh, where have you been? 
I've missed you. Well, I had a little business to attend to, Anne. Uh, I want you to meet Major Courtney, Mr. Gregory. Who is How do you do, Major? Hello, Miss Stevens. Anne's just been telling me about you. She's a rabid fan of yours, as I am of hers. In fact, I've quite lost my heart to her. Doesn't he say the most beautiful thing? Major Courtney, I wonder if you and I could take a stroll. I'm most anxious to speak to you alone. Why, yes, I suppose so. I want to come with you, Mr. Hood. Darling, you heard Mr. Hood say that he wanted to speak to Major Courtney alone. Now, don't worry, Anne. We'll be back in a few minutes. Please don't be long. You're being very mysterious, Hood. Uh, I didn't want to talk in front of Anne. You knew about Netta Mason. Oh, of course. Mind if I ask you some questions? No, fire away. Would I be right in thinking you're a government technician? That's a question I can't answer, Hood. Then would you tell me if you studied science in college? Yes, I majored in it. Then doubtless you're a member of Sigma Xi. Yes, I am. May I see your fraternity key? But I don't wear it often. I, I don't know where it is right now. Look, Hood, I don't know what you're driving at, but I'm not used to being cross-questioned like this. Sorry, but I'm going on with it. Why did you call on Nedda Mason in her dressing room this afternoon? That is none of your business. Then let me do a little guesswork, Major. I think you suspected Nedda Mason of being involved in espionage activities. Perhaps she displayed too much interest in your briefcase and you went in to talk to her about it. Listen, Hood, if you must know, when I went into Nedda's dressing room, I found her murdered. Found her or left her that way, Major? You're barking up the wrong tree, my friend. And if I were free to explain a few things to you, which I'm not, you'd believe me. Uh, uh, hi, Gregory, there you are. I've been looking all over the lot for you. How are you coming? I think we're on the last lap, Lou. Uh, tell me one thing. Sure, what is it, pal? Is Philip Fremont's picture shooting this afternoon? Oh, yeah, they're on stage eight. They're shooting a big gun battle scene right now. I just left there. You want to come over? Yes, Lou, I do want to. Very much. <laughs> That's all for today. We'll pick up the reverse shot in the morning. Hey, the lights. Everyone up to the set. Hey, Gregory, we can catch Fremont before he gets back to his dressing room. Yes, let's go on the set and talk to him. Come on, Major Courtney. Keep a weather eye open, Hood. We may be leading with our chin. I know, Major, but we have the advantage of surprise, I hope. Oh, hello, Mr. Fremont. Well, Gregory Hood, didn't know you were on the set. It's too bad you weren't here earlier. We were shooting some good stuff. Say, by the way, can you get here in the morning? I've got several terrific scenes then. Too bad that you won't be playing them, Fremont. I... Well, what do you mean, Hood? Call the police, Lou. Philip Fremont, your murderer. Philip Fremont? That was my hunch, too, Hood. Stay right where you are, Lou, and that goes for the rest of you. Don't you see I'm still carrying my revolver? Yes, a revolver containing blanks. You've just used it in the scene. Oh, no. No, I have another one in my pocket. A revolver containing live shells. I've switched them. And I shoot expertly through the pocket despite the tailor's bills. You're not getting me arrested. I'm clearing out. Why did you strangle Netta Mason? Because she was stupid and she quarreled with me. In any case, a girl who can mistake the map of an eight-year-old child for a valuable map such as the Major carries deserves to die. She was no more use to us. Us being your fascist superiors, of course. Correct. Major Courtney of G2. You didn't think fascism was dead, did you? Just because you and your boys killed a few Germans. Oh, the word's dead, all right. We'll never call it fascism again. But you'll be hearing from us. From you, we'll only hear a faint squeal from the gas chamber, Fremont. Yeah? You'll never get me. Oh, by the way, Hood, I knew you were pretty smart, but I didn't think you'd spot me. What mistake did I make? In leaving that Sigma Xi key in the dead girl's hand. Hey, but, Greg, you said the key didn't have any name on it. Exactly. That was the point, Lou. Any genuine key, such as Major Courtney owned, has the name on it, doesn't it, Major? Yes, invariably. So the absence of the name suggested that it was a dummy key. You were playing a scientist in your picture, Fremont, and so you were obviously wearing a prop key to give authenticity to the part. Careless of you to let the dying girl wrench it off your watch chain in the struggle. Yes, wasn't it? I must watch blunders like that in the future. Gregory Hood, I don't like you. Gunfire is pretty common on this set, and I think I'll give you a little treat. Fremont, you haven't a chance of getting out of this studio. You should know that. And think of the publicity it'll give us, Phil. It'll be terrific. It'll be fantastic. Shut up, will you, little rat? What do you say? Mr. Gregory ought to mind your own business, Hood. I'd say look out, above you. Do you expect me to fall for... Oh! oh! It got him. A falling paint bucket. Oh, boy, knocked him out cold. Gee, but you're lucky, Greg. A fine detective I am, saved from being shot only by a freak accident. But it wasn't you... an accident, Mr. Robin Hood. Cheaper. Hey, look up there on the catwalk. It's little Ann Norwood. Ann, darling, how can I thank you? Take me out to dinner, Mr. Hood, and then we can go dancing together. Is it a date? 
Yes, darling, it's a date. And you dance beautifully. So do you, Mr. Hayes. I'm afraid I'm a little short for you, though. Not a bit of it, Anne. I like my women petite. By the way, young lady, perhaps you'll tell me how you happened to be up on the catwalk this afternoon. Well, Mr. Hood, when you went out of my dressing room with Major Courtney, I could see by your face that something was wrong. I got scared for you, so I stepped out of the dressing room and... And uh, shadowed me, huh? Yes. I got to stage eight ahead of you and climbed the ladder to the catwalk so that I could see what was going on. Did I hurt Mr. Seymour when I toppled that paint bucket over on him? Not seriously, Anne. But you stunned him and probably saved my life. How can I ever repay you? Well, there, there is one way, Mr. Hood. What is it, Anne? You told me at lunch that, well, that you'd never married because you hadn't met the right woman. That's right, Anne. Keep on waiting, Mr. Hood. Please keep on waiting. <laughs> Jack, that was really a swell story, but what a detective you turned out to be. Why, Harry, what do you mean? I solved the case. What more do you want? Oh, I know, Greg, but to overlook the fact that that gun might have real bullets. Why, well, if it hadn't been for Anne... I know, I know. It was a slight oversight on my part. But, Harry, I can make a little mistake now and then, can't I? Hmm, I suppose... Now, Harry, don't stand there and tell me you never make a mistake. Not when it comes to choosing a wine, I don't, because I always choose Petri wine. I don't know why I bother talking to you. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. You like to hear about good wine just as much as the next fellow. And I like to talk about Petri wine because Petri wine is good wine. Well, it's just got to be. After all, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Winemaking is their heritage. A heritage passed on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. It's easy to understand why the Petri family knows so well the art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And it's easy to understand why the Petri business has grown and grown so that today the Petri family are America's largest independent winemakers. Yes, the making of Petri wine is a family affair, and the Petri family intends to keep it that way, because by so doing they can be sure that every bottle of wine that bears the name Petri is and always will be good wine. Well, Gregory, which particular story from the case book do you have lined up for us next week? Next week, Harry, I'm going to tell you about a strange woman who claimed to be able to see into the future. She predicted two violent deaths with frightening accuracy. The third death she happened to prophesy was uh, my own. See you next Monday, Harry. <laughs> The Case Book of Gregory Hood is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Original music composed and played by Dean Fossler. Gail Gordon plays the part of Gregory Hood. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. The Case Book of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by the Casebook of Gregory Hood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.